this. This presentation is on extreme IP backtracing. Um, test, test. Okay. Uh, I sat through two presentations here earlier and uh, was in the back and couldn't really hear well. Is this a good volume of voice to be able to hear me? All right, good. Um, I'm the developer and operator of the MyNet Watchman Distributed Intrusion Detection System, and I collect uh, firewall events from uh, about 13, 12, 1,300 firewalls around the world and try to make some sense of it and backtrace addresses uh, when we detect uh, when people have been compromised and try to send them notifications. So I probably backtrace about somewhere around 25,000 to 30,000 IP addresses a day and try to figure out who the heck owns them. And the rationale for putting this presentation together is to try to impart some of that knowledge, uh, bring visibility to the fact that this process is non-trivial, uh, and uh, maybe encourage people to uh, do more with their firewall logs as well. Okay, so uh, a lot of these events that show up in your firewall logs, your IDS logs, uh, really it's, it's non-trivial uh, tracing some of these IP addresses back to their owner. A lot of times if you do a Whois lookup, you end up with uh, nothing more than ISP. Um, and really what we're, what we're hoping to do is that a lot of these systems that people are using to attack other people are, are not their own system sitting on their own home DSL line. They've, they've broken into someone else's machine and they're launching attacks from these machines that they're controlling. And we have plenty of those machines out there, Code Red, Nimbo. Uh, based on that, uh, there's two ways really to improve the overall security of the internet. Uh, one goal is reducing the number of uh, total number of compromised hosts, and the other being to minimize the amount of time that a system remains compromised. Um, and so we have uh, to, to protect ourselves. We need to let people know people who have been broken into. Uh, need to let them know, hey, uh, you know, that we're seeing this in our logs and. I know a lot of people when they uh, fire up their firewalls and alarm bells start going off like crazy, uh, they get almost as upset as when they receive a piece of spam. What we, what we really have to realize is that probably about 95% of the scanning activity that, that you might be seeing in your logs isn't coming from uh, a hacker directly, but rather it's, it's really just another victim that's been compromised with something. So it's almost like these probes are a cry for help rather than something that's uh, intentionally hostile. Uh, this quote here is taken from an article written shortly after the February 2000 DDoS tax. Um, authorities pursuing the attackers say the servers they use belong to users that had no idea that their resources were being used to launch attacks. So here's uh, a pretty interesting trace. Um, this was a MyNet Watchman uh, incident. The uh, machine was compromised by the Microsoft spider worm. Uh, when we backtraced the IP, uh, it went over to uh, the right server, and you see the net name is GAN, uh, Central Reason of GAN RF. And if we actually, uh, if you see the notify contact, the first notify contact is SAM at GAN.RU. So, we go over to GAN.RU and we run this page through a translator. Uh, this is the Nuclear Regulatory Agency of Russia. So, uh, pretty nice to know that they are infected. Um, as far as an update on this, uh, the machine was actually, we notified them you know, weeks and weeks ago. Um, and as of uh, last week, they were still attacking people. So, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know what kind of response that uh, they're, they're planning, but hopefully they, they do something soon. Okay, so uh, we're going to start uh, by, by talking about um, some of the different tools you can use to backtrace and some interesting places that uh, information shows up. Um, we're going to start with, uh, you know, the first thing that you want to do when you're actually tracing something back is actually validate the source IP. 
Um, before we before you go off and spend a whole lot of time trying to trying to figure out who owns owns an address, it's really a good idea to validate where that actual traffic came from. Just because a, a, a packet has a source IP address that could be from uh, address space halfway across the world, there's nothing to stop that packet have been, from having been generated locally by somebody spoofing addresses or some kind of misconfiguration problem uh, or whatnot. So it's, it's certainly a good idea to use uh, either a packet analyzer or uh, uh, router debug commands to actually validate that the, the packet is actually coming in physically from some uh, remote physical interface. Uh, also, when trying to analyze firewall events in a broadcast network kind of topology, such as a cable modem network, uh, it's entirely possible that you'll receive bleed through traffic that's sourced from addresses that are uh, actually your neighbors on, on the same cable segment, whether they're using uh, private addresses or maybe even being misconfigured with valid public addresses from uh, other places around the world. So one of the next steps you can take to, uh, is to eliminate some potential bad IP addresses. Uh, in RFC 1812, they mentioned the Martian addresses. And uh, I was looking around to find a consistent definition of what the actual Martian addresses were. These are actually right from the RFC. Some people might argue that Link Local and some of the other IANA reserved stuff are belong in this group. but. Uh, the examples here are directly from the RFC. You've got the broadcast, loopback, multicast, and limited broadcast addresses. Um, and an interesting quote from the RFC uh, is below, a router should not forward any packet that has an in <laughs> invalid IP source address, which... I, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've had people ask me, you know, why is uh, IP address 224.0.0.5 attacking me? So you can also exclude private addresses, um, 10 dot space, 172.16 uh, through 31, 192.168. Uh, there's a class, uh, class A, B, and C, uh, slash 12, slash 16. Oops. Uh, this was a pretty interesting uh, who is record. Uh, actually, this is from Korea. Um, they actually published a who is record. If you look at the IP address range, it's for private IP address space. And uh, this came up on a discussion on the NAN address. And uh, uh, someone, uh, someone said, what was it? Uh, someone's done an AP NIC registration for RFC 1918 private space. Uh, perhaps they're suggesting that spammers or perhaps all of Korea be assigned private address space, which are fortunately non-routable. So uh, I mentioned this uh, a couple slides back, but you can also pretty much exclude anything that comes from an IANA address. Um, it's really doubtful that they're attacking you. Um, these are some of the reserved addresses. If you do a lookup for IANA at the Whois uh, servers at Aaron, you'll get this list. Um, and this is just the list that continued. You do have to be a little careful about just dismissing uh, reserved addresses because those are, of course, subject to change. Um, I know I had been considering a specific address range as being reserved uh, in my database, and then you know, six months later, some new reservation allocations have been given out. So addresses that were previously invalid as source addresses are now invalid. So you've got to be sure to check these IPs on a somewhat frequent basis. Um, it's, uh, you should definitely look for stuff that looks fake. Uh, 1.2.3.4 probably isn't attacking you. Uh, we also have some examples from uh, Next Visions, White Hat's uh, document on NMAP decoy addresses. Um, sometimes those show up in a trace. You know, and people try to be really stealthy, and they you see a trace that has 23.23.23.23 as the source IP, and then you see another packet from 24.24.24, and then you see something from a, a public address that's totally different, and you're like, huh? I wonder which address you're using there, buddy. <laughs> so. Um, you can do a limited amount of spoof detection on the addresses. It gets really difficult to detect spoofing because you know, ultimately where you receive the packet is somewhere near the edge of the network. And uh, Bob Moore 
weakness uh, rather than his uh, TCP IP weaknesses in the 4.2 BSD units TCP IP software. This is back in 1985. He describes the weakness, which is basically anybody can fill in the source address, uh, whatever source address they want, similar to snail mail. If, if you don't have access, physical access to the network, uh, there's really not an easy way to validate whether or not an address that's, that you appears to be attacking you is real or not. Um, however, there are some, and, and these are not extremely reliable, but at least some basic techniques that you can do that might give you some information to, to decide whether or not an address is spoofed. Because obviously if somebody's spoofing an address, you don't want to be picking up the phone or sending them a, a, a nasty gram saying, you know, why are you scanning me? Yeah. So here's a technique. It's, it's based on a one of the passive fingerprinting techniques, OS fingerprinting techniques, which actually looks at the TTL value. And so when you receive a packet and you, you, you check what the TTL was at the point that you received it, um, there's, there's default TTLs for, for most OSs and, and based on that and, and the count at where you received it, you can, you can do some deduction as to what type of machine uh, was attacking you, but also perhaps uh, find out if it was a spoofed address. Uh, by trace routing back to that IP, you'll have some idea of the number of hops that it actually takes to get to you from that IP. Um, Asymmetric routing may add a few hops in between, but they, they should be should be fairly standard. Um, and so, if you subtract the final TTL from the original TTL, um, and then do some guessing as to what kind of OS sent the packet, you can you can get uh, yeah. It's not totally reliable, but it can give you an idea of whether the packet was really spoofed or not. I mean, if you if you receive a packet and the 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 implied decrement in, in TTL implies that that host is like 10 hops away, but when you trace route to that IP, it's like 40 hops away, I'd say there's probably a pretty good chance that that, that was a, a spoofed address. And uh, I don't know if anyone here was in the Xprobe 2 talk, but there's actually a list of what the, uh, the default starting TTL values are for a lot of the major uh, operating systems. Oh, I didn't realize you did it to him. Oh, it looks like you stole it from him. <laughs> No, this was actually taken. I, I looked around for uh, the default TTLs all over the place, and there was this one link on Google that unfortunately was down. So this is from the cache page. Um, I haven't verified all of these, but uh, I have looked into the Windows and the Linux uh, TTLs. Um, and, and in the slides uh, on the CD-ROM, there's actually uh, some details about how you can change your default TTL to be whatever you want it to be. So here's an example of where this type of uh, spoof detection breaks down. You'll notice at route uh, at hop 10 we jump into 10 dot space, and then at hop 11 we jump into 172 dot space, and then the trace disappears after that. So we really have no idea exactly how many hops away uh, this particular address is. Another way to uh, validate whether or not an IP address is real is to perform route validation on it by uh, looking at BGP route tables. And there's a couple of uh, sites listed here that will uh, basically let you punch in a, an IP address and it will come back and, and tell you uh, uh, what the, route in, the, the active route entries are for that address. Uh, this is like a really, I've only just started doing this, playing with this, but it's really a powerful concept. Almost every other source of backtracing information is, is stale and, and old information, whereas, you know, BGP route information is about one of the, the few sort of active and real-time information. And I can't tell you the number of times when I've taken an address that I have some suspicion about whether or not it's been spoofed or not, plug it into BGP route tables, and it comes back network not even in table. So, and we got an example of that here. Yeah, here's a, uh, just a quick spoof example. This is a lookup of Aaron for 182.1.1.2, and of course, no match. And then here's the uh, results of the looking glass. Uh, no routes for this IP address, so it's pretty accurate that it's probably spoofed. Of course, the sooner you do this, the more accurate the information is, too. So, um, the team backtrace, uh, there's a couple of tools that are pretty standard tools for doing backtracing. Uh, one of them is NSLOOKUP, of course. Uh, if you just have an IP address, you want to find out what the reverse DNS name is. Uh, R 
done with that, you can you, know, you can query for starter authority, MX records, things like that that can give you more information about the domain itself. Here's an example, simple example, MS lookup, we set the type to pointer, looking at the full address in the inadder ARPA uh, namespace. And then we look for the SOA for the full address inadder ARPA uh, namespace, and of course it doesn't find it. So we drop off the last octet and look for the start of authority on the class C address, and here it is, uh, located at rr.com. One, one thing that uh, in, in, in the early stages that I was using this technique, uh, I was actually recursively backing up to, to even the class B level to do these uh, SOA lookups, and uh, uh, I can assure you that's not a very good idea because you have uh, tons of different ISPs within the same class B address. So you, you really don't want to go further than going to a class C level, and even that can be touch and go if you're dealing with an address space that's been very finely distributed across multiple uh, providers. Another one of the standard backtracing tools uh, is, of course, the Whois databases. Um, I do my first lookups at Aaron um, because it'll tell you if it's not uh, in their registry and they'll point you at, at one of the other NICs if it, if it is. Um, a lot of times the, the data that you get back, though, from the Whois servers uh, is totally bogus or, or totally out of date. Um, here you have uh, some of the advanced uh, query syntax for Aaron. Um, some of these are kind of fun to play with. Uh, doing full uh, lookups and, and net uh, lookups, you can actually do a net lookup on a, say, a class B, and it will give you every network in the database that is within that class B. One of the things I wanted to emphasize uh, from the previous slide is uh, uh, very often people will, will see the email contact address listed in an errand record and start shooting email at that person. Uh, it's really not a good idea as the typically the, the, the contact record there is a person who maintains the uh, IP address allocation space, not a person who deals with uh, security issues. So about the only case where you, you'd want to use that information is if you see a net block that's extremely small like a class C or below, then it might be safe to try to contact that person directly. If it's a large ISP, uh, you don't want to be sending email to the Aaron contact information. You just want to take the domain portion of that contact address and then, as we'll get into later, try to figure out what mailboxes to use and that sort of thing. So we talked about this. Let's see. Okay, so here's an example. Um, if you look, the contact email is at hotmail.com, which is pretty useful. Uh, and the phone number is pretty good, 123-456-7890. Um, so obviously not much is going to be able to, uh, to get through to any of these numbers. This record really emphasizes the whole problem with who is. Um, in, in that, yes, you, you can look up Aaron records and find out net block information. But very often those net block records don't tell you anything about the domain that, that is responsible for that address space. Because it sure ain't hotmail.com. And you, you, you really can't even, you really have to look at this carefully to realize that Internet America in Dallas, Texas, well, their domain name, it, it's probably iadfw.net. Uh, dot but doing that in an automated fashion in, uh, is, is almost impossible. It requires almost manually reviewing these records and, and making those associations between IP address and, and domain names. Okay, so uh, moving on, we have the intermediate backtrace category, uh, some more advanced tools as you, as you move further in the tracing. Uh, recursive who is, if, if, the, if the record isn't in Aaron, it will point you at RIPE or AP NIC, who in turn might won't point you to one of the national registries. Um, so by doing recursive lookups, you can narrow down uh, who actually owns the space. Um, and you can actually cross-check what you find in the IP-based who is records with domain-based who is queries. Uh, there's several places to do that. I like the Geek Tools proxy a lot. Um, and I just recently stumbled on the youwhois.com, um, so I'm not so sure about the reliability of it, but uh, it seems uh, universal who is sounds pretty nice. 
Yeah, cross-checking is, is, is very critical because uh, one of my pet peeves about uh, IP who is information is there, there's absolutely no ramifications whatsoever uh, when somebody allows that information to go stale and out of date, uh, which is the reason why it's so out of date. I mean, I see records constantly where the last update time was like uh, 1994 or earlier, whereas with domain who is information, there's real ramifications if, if you don't put a valid email address in there. You're not going to get notifications about your domain name expiring, and you could lose your domain. So very often, the domain uh, contact information will actually have much more timely information than what's in the uh, IP who is record. So once you have a domain that you might be pulling out of IP who is, look it up in the domain who is and, and validate the contact, see if the contact information is as good or possibly more up to date. Uh, this is an interesting example from a document. Uh, I don't know, I've been getting a ton of spam encouraging me to buy my .us domain name. And uh, Newstar, the people who administer the .us namespace, this is an interesting quote. Under current administrative practices, the U.S. top-level domain not only has no central database that can in turn create a central who is, there's also no mechanism in place for delegates to provision database information to the central registry. Even if delegates wish to provide new who is information to the U.S. TLD administrator, that capability is currently non-existent. So we're really not doing anything to fix the problem of uh, being able to trace these events back to an actual owner or administrator of an IP. Well, once you actually have, have extracted out a domain name that you believe is responsible, uh, your next step in, in, tr in trying to actually make physical contact is to figure out a, an actual email box to, to send it to. Um, and we have the uh, abuse.net site, which is sort of a de facto registry of, uh, of, of abuse uh, email addresses. And you can just basically punch in any domain and it'll try to uh, pop back and tell you what, what mailbox, whether or not it's an abuse at mailbox, security at, or postmaster at, what, whatever it is. And I think now he's up to about, I think he's got about 140,000 uh, domains in there. Uh, this site is more meant for dealing with spam related issues, but in, in large majority of cases, the, uh, the, the, the spam uh, mailbox is, is essentially the same as any kind of security related mailbox. Okay, moving on, we have some more advanced techniques, um, which first one is uh, if the Who's query doesn't give you the, the right domain, you can try uh, searching in Google, putting in parts of the, the information that you got back from uh, Who is. Um, try adding parts of the, the actual address, the city, the state. Um, here's a neat example of something that you don't see all the time. Here's if you look at the uh, address space for two of these, for, for each of these records, uh, they, they're two different records for the exact same space. Um, so it's kind of tough to tell who owns this. iWave.corp sounds a little bit more specific. Um, so here's the full record for iWave uh, Corporation. Uh, again, the contact is at Hotmail. Uh, not really helping us out. So. We do a Google search on iWave, uh, adding some address information in there, Vienna, Virginia, uh, and lo and behold, the third link down shows us uh, www.iwave.com. And of course, surfing to that website, uh, you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner, we actually have a, a real email box, not at Hotmail. One of the other advanced uh, tools that you can use is R who is, referral who is. Um, uh, when, I, when I first read through the uh, spec on R who is, I got extremely excited. I was like, you know, great, here's this much more specific tool of getting down at, at who owns uh, address space. Because, uh, you know, very often when you do a straight who is lookup, it's just going to resolve to the, uh, to the service provider and not to the actual end co company. And unfortunately, trying to contact a company through a service provider is pretty much a brick wall. Uh, you can pretty much be guaranteed that you're not going to have any communication for like weeks at a time. Uh, so our who is is basically a, a, a mechanism for ISPs to create more granular databases. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only a handful of service providers have implemented their own our who is servers. 
Uh, here's just a quick example. This is actually from uh, Geek Tools. I know it's a little bit hard to read, um, but this is just one that, you know, when you do a lookup at Aaron, uh, it will give you back, you know, a, a record for Exodus, and then say, you know, for further information, you can visit the Ahura server at Exodus. And the nice thing about the Geek Tools proxy is it gives you both records. It will actually automate, automatically go out and pull down the Ahura's record and give it to you. So this is uh, oh, this is the the domain uh, record based on what we pulled out of this slide here. This is the domain record. Um, we get hostmaster at pmi uh, or pmimaging.com, um, which is nice. This illustrates uh, why people should use role-based accounts for their contacts. If if Jared Blair leaves the company. Um, you don't want his email address as the contact in your in your information. A nice generic hostmaster at your company is great to use because whoever takes over as the next hostmaster can receive that email. So uh, there's other databases be besides who is. Uh, this uh, there's the routing registry on our records. Um, I list the RFC number there if you're if you're interested. The routing registry is similar to the BGP routes, except uh, it's stale and a lot older information. But sometimes you can find nuggets of gold. Um, here was a successful trace that we actually were able to pull out information with our R. Um, the culprit in this case was Click Network. Unfortunately, if we thought. Uh, IP who his records were out of date, the, uh, the route records uh, tend to be even a more order of magnitude out of date, so it, it isn't always a helpful resource, but uh, it's just another possible source to try. So yeah, here's what's actually returned by the routing registry, uh, hostmaster at clicknetwork.com. So then we move into some of the more extreme techniques. You have an IP address, it doesn't do any harm to see what ports they've got offered out to the world. And you know, perhaps there's a banner there that you can read that will tell you who administers the, the machine in question. Yeah, I've actually found a, a surprisingly high percentage of compromised servers are also running mail servers. I'd say it almost seems like almost as high as 25%. Uh, unfortunately, although uh, including a mail banner on your mail server is an RFC requirement, uh, I'd say probably only about you know 60% of people actually follow that standard, so it's not always effective. So here's an example. Uh, you know, this particular machine uh, had had 443 uh, open, had, uh, and so looking at the SSL certificate, uh, you can see on the subject line that's highlighted. Uh, LATimes.com. Uh, here we're getting some clue as to who might be running this machine. And you, you can get this to pop up just by doing a, you know, surfing HTTPS surf right to the IP address that's attacking you. You know, then this SSL certificate pops up and... So here's an example where we may have gone too far in trying to trace something back. Um, You'll notice in that the that the range for this uh, this this record is actually only four addresses wide, four IP addresses wide. So here's the record that's returned by the right uh, server. Um, so we try connecting up to the machine. It's got FTP open. Uh, we're running Wu FTP. Gee, I wonder how that got cracked. The ultra secure Wu FTP. Uh, so we didn't find anything there, but trying some of the other IP addresses in the range, uh, there's a web server on one of the other addresses, and uh, there it is, portaladultos.com. Click our key. <laughs> so click our key to see uh, Las Titas de Brittany. <laughs> so here's the domain record for Polka portaladultos.com and uh, we do get a webmaster at portaladultos.com as an email address here. So there's times that you trace these back and, and you know through whatever you know by whatever reason you still have no 
the answer as to who might who might run this machine. So you can always kind of move out a level, take a step back, and find out uh, you know, who runs the anonymous autonomous system. But my, my objective is always to try to uh, get the, IG, IP, the backtrace to be as specific as possible so we can make uh, direct contact with, with whoever is actually responsible for the system. But uh, as Jason said, when that's not possible and you want to at least get a message to someone, uh, you can use the autonomous system information. Um, in general, only a larger or midstream ISP is going to have BGP autonomous system numbers. So you're not going to really be able to get uh, extremely specific in, in many cases, but at least gives you gives you an avenue to go somewhere. So here's uh, an AS example. Um, this is a BGP looking glass lookup on uh, on an IP address, and I've circled the terminating AS record or the terminating AS number 6197. And this is the same command that we used previously, where we got the no network found. When, when the network is actually routable, the output will look like this. So here's the full record uh, from Aaron on the autonomous system 6197. Um, the contact here. Yeah, this, this is a great example of, uh, of useful, not useful information. Uh, I actually consulted for Bell South for a number of years in their early days. And when I saw this record, I was, I was dumbfounded that the, the contact person is listed were working at Siemens. And uh, I was pretty sure there was no logical relationship between Siemens and Bell South other than that Bell South occasionally buys a phone switch from Siemens. And uh, so I had kind of, uh, I had actually just uh, punted on this, assumed that it was, was, was some kind of uh, error. And unbelievably, about uh, four months later, I was standing on a train platform having come from a meeting and there was a guy standing next to me holding the same envelope that I had, so I assumed he had been at the same meeting. Just, I had some time to spare, so I went up and chatted with him, and we started talking, and, you know, find, you know a few minutes into it, find out he works for Siemens, and I'm like, what's your name? I was like, uh, Roller Dawson. I'm like, wait a minute, I need to talk to you. <laughs> so, this is like the real example of extreme backtracing, and I had to hunt the guy down to a train platform. And, uh, this is a, another good example of the, of the breakdown and problems with, with the Aaron records. What essentially happened was he, uh, he, he, was originally, he did originally work for Bell South, and when the, IP, when the AS number was registered, they, uh, he used his contact handle. You know, several years later, he left the company and went to work for Siemens, and he began allocating uh, address space, assigning it to his handle name. Well, there's no mechanism to say, you know, all these addresses that I used to uh, administer, I, I don't work for that company anymore, so remove those references from me. So, he, you know, we're sitting here having a person, uh, you know, who doesn't even work for the company uh, anymore, still being the contact, contact uh, person. So, that's what happened in this case. Yes, uh, really, it would have been much nicer if they had a role-based account here. Uh, Willard, uh, originally, like you said, he had his email address at Bell South. He updated his personal record to show that he was working at Siemens, and here we have an implied relationship between Siemens and Bell South, which really doesn't exist. So here's another uh, extreme technique you can use if NetBIOS is enabled on the machine. Uh, send them a win pop-up message using NetSend. Uh, hello. I haven't quite figured a technique to actually make this be successful. I've probably sent about a hundred of these and I've never had the person contact me, but uh, I have a feeling if the message was crafted in an in intriguing way, such as, you know, this is the Microsoft Security Management Center in, in, uh, in uh, Washington, uh, please call us immediately at this phone number, that might work. This, this is one of my favorite uh, backtraces. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's amazing how people are willing to name their machines uh, things that give away a tremendous amount of information. Um, here we did a, an NBT stat to, to get a uh, iteration of the machine names, and uh, the work group name is called Aducci underscore Dorf. I thought it was Doofus at first, but I thought it was Dorf. And uh, uh, I happened to also do a trace route to that address and could sort of see from the trace route that it looked like uh, given the uh, CHI that it was probably in the Chicago area. 
and uh, then just do a Google search for Ducci Dorth in Chicago, and bam, law firm, law firm of a Ducci Dorth and Blackenship and a bunch of other names. So there's an example where just this little tiny piece of information, if it's unique enough and, and, and you know not like John Smith, and you've got a little bit of information, you can actually trace that back to, to a machine name. Now the sad part of the story is I called up this uh, company just to give them a heads up, got the secretary and said, uh, you know, I need to talk to your security manager or your MIS manager, and she's like, uh, who? No, we don't have one. So I was like, okay, well, let me talk to your managing partner. And I, I get Mr. Blankenship on the phone and just very nicely and politely explain to him that it looks like one of those machines been hacked. You might want to have it checked out. I'm not trying to sell you anything. And his response was like, okay, thanks. Have a nice day. So here's the, uh, we've actually done a little bit of cross-checking of the domain record with uh, what we found and found the responsible domain to be adlmd.com. So uh, you know, sometimes, no matter what you do, there's nothing you can find out about an address. So uh, you punt. You you find out what what is the most directly upstream uh, address from the one you're looking to trace, and see where that leads. Um, sometimes it's only the service provider, but you never know. It's uh, really important to get as close as possible. Here's a trace that, uh, well, it's a record that comes back from RIPE uh, showing that this address space is registered to Intercom Pro. Um, but the Notify contact has a totally different domain. It's tacta.net. So whenever you see disparate, you know, disparate information like that, the people we really want to contact are Intercom Pro. So we do an MS lookup uh, looking for mail exchange records for Intercom Pro. And uh, as you can see, there are none. No address records available for them either. So here's a trace route to the IP. Um, trace 22 is the IP that, uh, the, hop 22 is the end of the trace. Hop 21 is the next uh, IP just above it. So uh, we try looking at that for more information. Uh, and we find that it's registered to TACTA.net, which uh, TACTA uh, corresponds with the other address that we found. So it looks like this is about as close as we're going to be able to get is TACTA.net. So, conclusion. Uh, yeah, it's surprising how many corporations uh, have a isolationist view of the internet um, and they're very concerned about protecting themselves uh, on the inside, very hard firewall, crunchy exterior. Uh, sometimes they actually deploy stuff within their, their networks, but you know, back when Code Red and Nimble and some of these other worms were hitting, you know, you'd see in the web logs direct evidence of all these machines that were compromised. And most most companies really, I mean, they don't make their money uh, tracing these back and being nice to people and letting them know they're broken into. So they really don't do it. Um, and as a result, you, know, you have a tremendous number of already broken into machines just waiting for someone to grab control of them and point them DDoS somebody. Unfortunately, machines that are port scanning you today could be DDoSing you tomorrow. That's the importance of trying to backtrace them. So you do read your logs, I hope. Uh, there are services that can help you do it. Uh, Lawrence's site, MyNet Watchman, is excellent. Uh, DShield is very similar. If you don't like the idea of sending your logs outside of your network, uh, you think that that might be insecure somehow, then there are solutions you can deploy internally, Swatch, Log Sentry. So, so uh, that's, that's our presentation. So uh, do we have a, any questions? Or? What's that? Oh, yeah, the presentation, all the, all the slides are on the CD, and if you look at the, the notes view, I apologize, but the notes view is totally screwed up. My, my PowerPoint skills are only this big. So I have uh, on my website, uh, jason.net, that's J-A-E-S-O-N.net. Um, if you go to that site, uh, it will it will take you into a place where you can actually download the latest and greatest presentation with all the, the notes fixed on it.